Okay, this is Dave Winkler of the Naval Historical Foundation with this week's edition of Naval History Book Reviews uh, Author Chat. And today we have Jason W. Smith, the Assistant Professor of History at Southern Connecticut State University. And we're going to be talking about his book, To Master the Boundless Sea, the U.S. Navy's Marine Environment and Cartography of Empire. A little bit about uh, Dr. Smith, who grew up in eastern Pennsylvania. He got his BA in history from Westchester University, PhD from Temple, and a class of 57 postdoc at the U.S. Naval Academy. He taught there briefly for a, a year or so. Uh, his book earned him the John Lyman Book Prize for Best Naval and Maritime Science and Technology uh, Prize from the North American Society of Oceanic History for uh, 2018. That's that's a pretty big deal. That's quite an accomplishment. It, the book has earned itself quite a bit of praise. And with that, let's uh, meet uh, Dr. Smith and pull out of this. And there he is. Hello, Dr. Smith. Uh, Hello. First, yeah, first question I have for you. How did you get interested in naval history? Well, um, it's nice to look back on those memories. Um, it's really, really began very early in my in my childhood. Uh, my grandfathers were both uh, veterans, uh, army veterans, one of Korea and one of World War II. Um, and spending time with them really invested me with an interest in military history. Um, as far as uh, naval and maritime stuff. I uh, I was really influenced as I think at a pretty impressionable age by the 50th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack in 1991. Um, there was considerable media coverage, a lot of you know documentaries on television, um, and I was really swept up by by that the drama of it, the tragedy of it, um, and uh, and and so that I think coupled with um, my my time with my one of my grandfathers who was a model ship and airplane builder. Uh, really got me hooked as a young boy in naval history, uh, and uh, and then that interest sort of proceeded into um, my undergraduate days at Westchester, where I uh, sort of unbeknownst to me there were two naval maritime historians on the faculty, which is a, a pretty rare thing, especially for me to 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 not know about it, coming in as a student interested in that, and so that was a really pleasant surprise, and that only. Um, you know, bolstered my interest in the subject. I wrote my my senior thesis um, on the the sort of technological issues around the post Civil War Navy as an undergrad. Uh, and then when I went to graduate school, um, you know, my my interests only only broadened methodologically in bringing together cultural and environmental history with military, maritime, and naval history. Um, and it and it really culminated in um, the the academic that I am and and in the book, uh, my my first book. First book. Uh, obviously, a dissertation topic. How did you get steered towards that? Yeah, I mean, it was really evolutionary uh, as well. Uh, I think it, it really began when I was an undergraduate. Uh, one of the, the professors I was speaking about um, had, uh, he was a great lecturer, uh, just a, a really magnetic lecturer, and he talked. Uh, in his military history class, a little bit about Matthew Fontaine Maury, the naval scientists of the antebellum era, which I suppose we'll be talking a little bit about in, in a few minutes. Um, but he uh, always said uh, that if he could go back and write a dissertation again, he would really want to look at Maury and the ways in which his uh, hydrographic and oceanographic work in, in some sorts, some cases sort of might have laid the groundwork for American expansionism into, into the Pacific in particular. Uh, and he was really posing it more as a question than, than, than a definitive argument. And so I always had that in the back of my mind. And when it came to um, really a first year uh, research seminar in graduate school, sort of casting about for a topic, um, I decided to dive into that question a little bit more deeply, uh, and it just then, uh, you know, accrued over the years. It became my dissertation topic, um, and uh, and it really combined this early question that was always in my brain with with my own interests, my, my own growing interest in environmental history, right? The, the history of humans interactions with the natural world that I was learning a lot about in graduate school. And I could see the ways in which I could bring these various interests of mine together uh, by, by looking at 
at, at naval hydrography, surveying, and chart making, because it seemed to me that if I wanted to really get at the, the relationship between the Navy and the sea, um, the best way to do that would be through naval science and through, through the charts themselves. Well, the, uh, your book here is very well researched. You talk a little bit, uh, the notes, the bibliography is incredible as far as your, uh, uh, your sourcing. Can you talk, where did you find the goods uh, that went into this? Well, um, you know, I, I really tried to span a good part of the 19th century, really from the, the 1830s when naval science is first institutionalized at the depot of charts and instruments, uh, which became the Naval Observatory and Hydrographic Office, ultimately the Oceanographic Office uh, and other spin-off institutions, really from that, that birth date in the 1830s all the way through the turn of the 20th century. And so I'm, I'm bringing together a lot of different sources um, I, I was interested in, in the voices of commercial mariners who, who, whom, who these charts served, um, for, through, especially throughout the antebellum period when the American merchant marine and whaling fleet were really at their heights. Um, so, so a lot of uh, journals of whalers and merchant mariners uh, in the early chapters, when I, when I get into Mari, um, uh, the, the, the records held by the National Archives, um, in the, the Naval Observatory um, record group 23, I believe, and 35 is the hydrographic office. I relied a lot on those in sort of the mid-century, mid-19th century. Um, when I talk about exploring expeditions, you know, the great virtue of researching and exploring expeditions before the Civil War is that they produce, for the most part, produce voluminous textual records, official and unofficial. So some of the journals of the surveyors and naval officers, some of them held at Yale uh, at the Beinecke Library. I'm here in New Haven, so so that was sort of fortuitous in the way that that came together. Um, uh, and then towards the end of the century, when I really talk about the emergence of a, of a strategic cartography and the, and the work, the strategic work that hydrography and hydrographers did and the ways in which naval strategists at the highest levels of the general board are talking about George Dewey, uh, Henry C. Taylor and others, um, you know, are, are talking about the value of hydrographic information to the kind of expansion of American sea power. Um, the records of the the um, of the Naval Historical Collection at Newport at the Naval War College were really useful. Um, some of the strategic studies that that those officers did, some of the the, the lectures that were given there, um, and I benefited from a fellowship at the Naval War College to help me look at that. Um, so, and, and, and also, you know, in the book, I get to, to literary sources about the ways in which American naval exploration was really linked to a tremendous fascination by the, excuse me, by the American public, um, especially in the years before the Civil War. Um, and so, um, so some of the literary uh, um, texts, not just produced by the, by these, these explorers themselves, but the ways in which they were, um, uh, they were they were received uh, <clears throat> by American writers like Poe, Melville, James Fenimore Cooper. Those are some of the sort of broad breadth of the source material that I was looking at across the 19th century. So, uh, 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 others have written about him. You, you can interpret his significance to understanding ocean currents and place in cartography under the auspices of the Navy. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Mari is really a central figure. Uh, and, you know, I mean, he's 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 known um, to, to, to some degree as the pathfinder of the seas. He's credited by by historians of science, although sometimes sort of grudgingly and not without criticism as the father of modern oceanography. He's really a guy that 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 sees a, a need um, to to uh, expand the, the 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 environmental and navigational knowledge of the navy in the in the years of, of the 1840s and 1850s, and he becomes the superintendent of the naval observatory in Washington, and in that position, really brings together a lot of the old logbooks of the navy, and and it really by the 1850s enlists a core of thousands, an international core really of thousands of mariner observers who are recording in his 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 um, abstract log uh, all sorts of environmental data, and he compiles these into wind and current charts, which are really revolutionary in the way that they represent cartographically various aspects of the of the natural world, including winds and currents, of course, ocean temperatures, metric pressure, um, 
whales uh, as well, right? And so there, there are these, this, this, this tremendous commercial need for an American whaling fleet and merchant marine that are still, you know, in the 1850s, the vast majority of these ships are still driven by winds and currents. Uh, and so Maury really revolutionizes Mariner's understanding and enlists them in the process of scientific investigation so that if they participate in his program, they receive the charts free of charge. And it takes a while for, for him as a naval officer to win over a lot of these commercial merchant mariners and whalers. Um, but when they see the payoff uh, and when, and when, when shipping, uh, ship owners and, and, and marine insurers see the payoff, um, they, they're, in, they, they're, they're pretty quick to come around to Maury's method and to use his chart. Mm -hmm. So for example, the, the famous uh, the statistic is that the, the voyage in the 1840s around Cape Horn from New York to San Francisco used to take like 187 and a half days on average. With Maury's wind and current charts, that voyage was reduced in half. This is the clipper ship era, right, of the 1850s, to something about 90 days. So if you can imagine that in the context of the sort of California gold rush, uh, you know, the, the, the significance is pretty amazing. Um, but one of the, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I sort of, th that's the traditional understanding of Maury and people have written about him that way. Um, but two things that I would add to that briefly, uh, <clears throat> one is that um, Maury was a great literary figure. His famous book, the one that's credited with the sort of birth of oceanography is the, called The Physical Geography of the Sea, which was published in 1855. And he really brings together all of this data in a way that, and this, is, this speaks to his relationship with the merchant marine in a way that was accessible. That, that, that people could understand, that, that got away from that scientific jargon uh, and really framed the sea in really literary, uh, figurative and symbolic ways that really resonated with people, which I think is, a, is an important character characterization. And one I think he shares in fact with, with an, another important figure later on and that is Alfred T. Mahan. So we'll talk about that maybe. Um, but then the other thing about Maury is that um, he really has a foot in three important maritime communities. One is the civilian merchant marine and whaling fleet, one is the navy, and another is the, the scientific community. And in an era in the 1850s when these communities are beginning to diverge and go in different directions as science professionalizes, as the navy professionalizes, uh, and there, there is this tension I think between civilian mariners uh, commercial mariners and naval officers, Maury really tries to bridge these gaps. And he has some great success, although uh, he has he struggles in a lot of ways as well. But I, I think as a, as a central figure in bringing these disparate, in some ways disparate communities together, he serves a really important function. Okay. okay. After the Civil War comes into play, can you discuss the development and the impact uh, of a strategy such, as you mentioned before, uh, Alpha Phil and Mahan, on, on pushing the requirements to build overseas infrastructure at places such as Midway. Sure, yeah, I mean, I talk a good bit about Mahan, you know, and it, much like Maury in the ways that he's been written about fairly deeply in, in, in the scholarship, um, but, but, but I wanted to really focus in what I thought was a, 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 a really overlooked aspect of what Mahan was writing about when he publishes his book in 1890 and then in a series of articles that appear in, in popular magazines throughout the 1890s. Uh, and, and it's in, in one in which he's really transforming the sort of cultural or symbolic meaning of the of the sea, right? I mean, he's coining this term sea power, which is really, you know, it's, it's evocative, I think. Uh, and then he talks a little bit in his correspondence to various people about how, you know, he played around with terms like maritime power, um, but that didn't really that didn't really flow off the tongue, right? So sea power, he 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 was very clear that he was thinking about it conceptually, but also in terms of its resonance with readers. And so, you know, what I see, I see Mahan as a central figure in a lot of ways, but in, in terms of my own work, in really transforming the navies and, and as well as a wider political and, and, and social community of readers, um, transforming the meaning of the sea from a commercial space, which Mari would have defined it as in the physical geography of the sea, Mari called it a, 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 a common highway, a, a commercial highway. 
uh, towards a more a militarized place, a place that could be commanded, a, a, a place that could be a domain of a particular nation state or its navy uh, or its merchant marine for that matter. Uh, and so he's using words like, um, like, like Cuba and the West Indies as being fortresses uh, to guard the approach, the windward passage, the approach to any unbuilt, yet unbuilt canal in Central America. He talks about um, Hawaii as an outpost of sea power, right? So he's really using these terms in ways that I think suggest the broader reconceptualization of the meaning of the sea away from primarily commercial meanings, although those meanings still remain, um, to primarily geostrategic meanings re revolving around this concept of sea power. So um, that's the way that I deal with him. And, and really, in a lot of ways, and as scholars have dealt with him before, Mahan is, is really, um, he, he, he conceptualizes this, but he's really bringing together um, impulses and activities that had existed prior to 1890, right? So in terms of Hawaii, you know, the, one of the things I talk about in one of the chapters is that the Navy's out there, you know, uh, William Reynolds in command of the steamer Lackawanna, he, he had been a veteran of the U.S. exploring expedition in the 1830s and 1840s, you know, claims midway in 18, what, 67, the same year as Alaska is acquired. There, there is this push into the Pacific in the years after the Civil War in which the Navy becomes interested in these places for their commercial value, right? Midway was would be or could be at the time really important for the the, the um, um, Pacific Mail Steamship Company, uh, but uh, but in ways that were emerging geostrategically for the nation as it emerges from the Civil War. And so often, you know, we're, we're, when we think about the Navy in the post-Civil War era, we think about this sort of doldrums, the dark ages of, of technological retrenchment and things. And that's true to some degree. But if you look hydrographically and what the Navy's doing in exploration, that period is really robust in terms of its activities. And it, and it leads to a point where Mahan is not the, not the turning point, but he's actually capturing, I think, a process that's already in place. Those hydrographic <laughs> operations are in the 20th century. Well, I mean, I, if you trace uh, um, naval science across the 19th century, you see that there are these times of intense activity followed by times of, of inactivity. Uh, and, and so, and a lot of it has to do with leadership, people like Mari uh, or others. I uh, talk about uh, the, the, um, the um, commander of the, the Bureau of Equipment, uh, a guy named Royal Bradford in the 1890s and the early 20th century as being key to really the strategic use of hydrography. Um, that, that sort of, those ebbs and flows continue into the 20th century. Um, but, uh, you know, so that, so that you see, for example, um, you know the, the 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 challenges of the amphibious landing at Tarawa in November 1943. Um, you know that the well-known story that you know the Navy didn't understand the way the tides worked over the reefs around Tarawa, um, and that in fact the Navy was using a chart from the Wilkes expedition that was 100 years old at the time, right? So there are those kinds of stories in which the Navy really did not, in, in, a, in a sustained way, pursue hydrography in the way that uh, perhaps it should have, given their experiences at the turn of the 20th century around the Spanish-American War. But, the, but the, the 20th century also brings in new dimensions of naval warfare, right? Submarine warfare, warfare in the air, um, in which the, the cartographic, uh, the needs to, 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 to map and to survey and to chart the, the environment uh, above, on, and under the water become really, really important. And so there, it, there, uh, there is a, um, a, 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 a coming together of the, the, the oceanographic civilian community and naval science in the period after World War I. The historian Gary Weir has a great book on this called The Notion in Common that people should check out really for the 20th century stuff. Um, but all the way to today um, and, and issues um, Around navigation, we know we we've seen this with the uh, the, the uh, vessels uh, running aground, like the the San Francisco and the uh, Seamount a few years ago. Um, the um, uh, the the various navigational issues with the Fitzgerald and the um, John S. McCain. Um, so so you know I, I would say that the sea matters here, and that, you know to a sailor that probably doesn't seem very revelatory, um, but for historians who are looking at the Navy's history or the history of oceans, um, the sea really has been mostly absent as an actor here. 
Uh, and so I would really bring that to the fore. And I would, I would just say that, um, you know, today we deal with climate issues that are also strategic issues. Um, and so I think the Navy is to some degree grappling with the ways in which it, it, it is, is dealing with the changing natural world and the strategic dimensions of those. And I think that that's not necessarily a new story or not necessarily a story that's confined to human made climate change. Um, but it is a story that, in fact, is quite old and the Navy's been dealing with for quite some time. And that's the sort of the history that I wanted to to write about. I think that's a great close for the, uh, this discussion. Uh, I guess uh, one more question. How does one uh, obtain a copy of the book? Sure. Well, um, it's uh, just within the last year been released in paperback. So it's um, uh, the, the retail uh, cost is a little bit less. Um, I think it's uh, it's so it's available in hardback and in, in soft cover as well. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, you can order it directly from the publisher uh, publisher that is University of North Carolina Press. Or you can ask your independent bookseller even better to uh, order it for you. Uh, it's easily available on the internet uh, and also in electronic format as well if, if you're interested in reading it on your tablet. Okay, well, thank you for that. I'm uh, look forward to in the future someday. My pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity.